I did not get enough sleep at night. I believe it is apparent. <laughs> it's like you take a breath, like, oh god.
Good evening, everyone. And it is our January Speakers Night for 2024. Welcome to the RAS Toronto Centre. We are online tonight, and I am Dr. Elena Hyde, the second Vice President of the RAS Toronto Centre. This is our Speakers Night presentation, a little bit of a different one, as you might be able to see. Uh, please note that this meeting is an online-only presentation and not at Ontario Science Centre. Our president, Tom Luton, will be talking about our various programs later on. But first, we have a very special 2024 event to kick off. Um, to get us started, I'd like to just take a second to acknowledge that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre meets on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishinaabe peoples. These lands are part of the Ditch with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, Metis, and Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. As we engage in astronomy here together, we respect, learn from, and honor the deep relationship between Indigenous people, the sky, and the earth. Now to introduce our speaker, I have a little bit of a surprise twist, something you haven't seen from me before. Uh, I'm actually the speaker as well. So I get to introduce myself. As I mentioned, I am the second vice president of RASC Toronto Centre. My name is uh, Dr. Elena Hyde, and I'm actually a professor at York University as well. Um, here I teach uh, physics and astronomy, and I am the director of the Allen I. Carswell Observatory that you can see behind me. Uh, my personal specialties are in uh, data science, machine learning, uh, optical astronomy, and of course, uh, telescopes, telescopes, telescopes. Um, I have a lot of interest in variable stars and SX Phoenicius in particular is the ongoing project of the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. Tonight, we are going to leave you all on a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a tour. <laughs> so um, let me go ahead and get started here. We're going to switch modes uh, very quickly. Now, I do have a special event for you all. It has actually cleared in the skies over Toronto. So right now we are sharing the view from the one meter telescope here at the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. Uh, as you can see here, I will just take any guesses from any RASC members which solar system object they might like to guess this particular uh, thing is. Uh, we are pointed through a little bit of clouds at the moment, so it may... Oh, there it goes. It just disappeared. Uh, we will be bringing it back as often as possible, um, but if the clouds trigger a closure, uh, that, will be, uh, that will be our dome safety system coming into play. So let me go ahead and uh, switch to our tour mode. And I'm going to hand over, and we're actually going to walk through the Allen I. Carswell Observatory uh, together. So here we go, first ever switching uh, mode. Okay, for Rask, so please excuse the uh, mess. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Hello everyone, welcome to the LNI Carswell Observatory. This is the warm room, the massive control center. If any of you have ever wondered what it's like to be inside of a brain, it's really cool. Telescope brains are awesome. On the right hand side, we have our primary one meter control system showing the lovely planet Jupiter and several of its moons. RASC members may be able to identify. We also have our control system for the one meter down here, as well as a current view of the sky uh, and lots of fun things that I will tell you about uh, once we reach the slide chair show. Uh, on the left side, we have our weather system and the 60 centimeter, which we're not currently running because we didn't want to do too many things all at once just tonight. So if you will all come with me, we'll go into the one meter telescope and um, very carefully show you just what we have here at the observatory. So um, come through this way. Now our viewers may need to turn off the brightness contrast on their screens. I'll turn on some lights. And welcome 
the inside of the one meter dome. This is one of two uh, domes that we have at the Illinois Carswell Observatory up on the pedestal, just up pointed through the slit at the moment is the, uh, well, I should say our favorite, but um, our newest telescope at the observatory, the one meter Plane Wave 1000 uh, telescope. Well, this telescope arrived in 2019 and is the one that's currently pointing through the clouds, allowing us to see Jupiter. We have this telescope hooked up so that its views can also be shared over a projector. And we'll just walk through very quickly the one meter dome. This is a uh, our projector setup that works wirelessly across with the telescope. And if you come across the side, you'll see some roughness from the destruction of the new domes that came on just last year. Uh, I suppose another fun astronomy trivia. If you can guess what component of the domes this was. Uh, well, I, you might be an electrical engineer uh, because these were actually the electrical connection for the dome shutter to come down when it is too cloudy. So we'll come around this side, telescope, and we're just going to try to point up here. We'll try with our camera and then we'll try again on the uh, uh, side. Is anything coming through? All right, so slightly too dark to come through. We'll come back the other way. Uh, let me just turn on the light. It won't hurt me like that. So we're just turning on an extra light. Let me turn this to the Okay. Now we've reached the back of the one meter telescope. This telescope is currently tracking and activated on the planet uh, Jupiter. Um, so we won't try to touch it or move it because its sensitive gearing system is not something we want to compromise. We have two dual NASA mesh ports, which I will talk about later, but we have an instrument side on this end, which hosts a CCD, a spectrograph, which is here on the bottom, as well as the Malin Cam camera, which is currently showing you those beautiful images. All right, so quick tour aside, let's head over to the 60 centimeter dome for our next trip. So we're just going to turn off the light just to make sure we don't uh, check our view. So come back down this way. So you might have noticed we're going in a circle. That is by design. These domes uh, work with altitude and azimuth. And of course, being able to track your dome position in azimuth means that wherever your telescope's pointed, you can match your dome position to it. This dome will actually follow the azimuth of the telescope. And the keen eye amongst you might have noticed it does actually rotate in an altitude azimuth orientation. All right, so come on through this way. We're definitely being cold in the one meter. Let's go back to one room and through to the 60 consider. It your screen to small. Oh, did it go? All right, just checking, I'm coming through still. We're going back into the 60 centimeter telescope. Uh, I believe it's coming through. Yes, that's the screen. I see it. You might notice a lot of red lights as well. Okay, this is our warm room door. We're very proud of it, despite it is a little finicky. Keeps what warm air we can into the telescope. There we go. All right, now we're through to the instrument. This is our telescope emergency backup system, also installed last year. These are undestructible power sources that allow one last close, just in case anything happens. All right, so come on to this way. Now you'll notice that it's needed to change in the acoustics because this dome is very, very different. This is a 60 centimeter dome. It's the exact same diameter, 22 feet uh, diameter dome, but it hosts this lovely old already that German Equatorial Mount telescope. This telescope was actually original to York University. It was installed around the same time as the building was built back in the late 1960s. 
It works with the same exact gear uh, on the this back end, the same exact gear up there for Ori and Deck uh, all this time. Um, this last year, we have done some extensive renovation on its encoders and controls. That also received a nice new coat of paint. But because of its design for 60 centimeters, this telescope is much, much bulkier than what you will have seen for the one meter, as well as being uh, fairly fantastic. It goes way up in the air. Um, and especially when it's rotated over, uh, it's quite a thing to see. So there's no platform here. We're not going to walk up there. Um, we have to leave the telescope a lot of room to move. And as I find the uh, I will just actually see if we can point to the floor really quick because I will discuss this later. I'm not sure if it'll come through, but these floors are brand new and we're really excited about them. <laughs> um, so our, our new build control systems, the same on both telescopes. It's very, very accessible here. So we're going to show you the control box on the 60. Um, we have dome rotation, open, closed, remote and local capability, as well as tie in with our weather system. Final fun fact about the 60, it also hosts a guest instrument or a guest installation by a master student called Coil, which is just at the top here, these lovely aluminum canisters. All right, so enough of being cold in the 60. Let's travel back to the warmers and close the doors for the rest of the Alumni Cardinal Observatory uh, tour presentation. Just in case anybody missed the tour tonight, um, this is roughly what you would have seen uh, in a little bit more detail. And of course, lots of wonderful views of the planet Jupiter are still coming in on our main screen up here. So let's go ahead and switch modes again. We're going to switch back to our lovely uh, telescope mode. And I'm going to take you uh, away from this camera over to the, uh, the main display here. <laughs> All right, so that was our very, very fast, uh, fast and speedy telescope tour of the LNI Carswell Observatory. I wanted to make sure we did it in person just because it, sometimes it's hard to describe with just slides. So I'm going to go ahead and steal our slide uh, our slide share away from Jupiter. So I'm handing off our Jupiter controls. Uh, we uh, we have had some pretty good luck viewing uh, Uranus and the Moon as well tonight. A few Messier objects, so we might save some of those to social media or something for later. Now let's go ahead and navigate over to uh, the last part of the last shall I say component of the talk tonight. Um, All right, uh, now we've transferred over to our last part of the uh, sort of component. We've gone through the observatory. You've seen both domes, I hope. I'm not sure how exactly what quality that was walking through. But um, now I want to tell you a little fun story about the astronomy and renovations that have happened here at the LNA Carousel Observatory in the last, uh, gosh, two years. It has been action packed. And as a lot of you might realize or know from personal experience, when you have very, very old telescope equipment, it tends to, well, it tends to start to creak. And if you're very unlucky, also leak. <laughs> and especially old gears and old control systems can have a lot of trouble tracking and uh, pointing on objects. So the, uh, the Alamey Carswell Observatory has been here for since the 1960s. And uh, at York, uh, York University, we have been working the last two years to actually um, do a whole slew of different kinds of, um, different kinds of, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, different kinds of updates, renovations, and modernizations. So I mentioned before that my own background is in data science and, uh, and some forms of engineering as well as astronomy. So getting our data systems upgraded has been part of the task as well. So if you haven't heard about us before up at uh, York, um, York University, just a little bit of fun fact. We do have online public viewing, which is basically what you just saw, a little tiny bit, but it runs every night uh, or every Monday night from 9 p.m. And we also do Wednesday tours tonight. So just before this uh, broadcast here at RASP Toronto Centre, 
we were actually running a in-person tour um, from 5 p.m. or sunset, I actually should say. We also have online telecube on YouTube, which is uh, similar, um, but has different, all kinds of different broadcasts. Our public viewing has returned. And of course, we have all the usual social media as well. So we have a lot of outreach as well as research and various other um, uh, things that we do. We have undergraduate laboratory exercises that use a telescope for their classes, which is quite fun. But it also means that we have a lot of programs for solar observing, galaxy characteristics, exoplanet transit, and of course, color magnitude diagrams. Some of the really fun stuff, I would like to say. And uh, we've already talked about public outreach, so I'll go a little bit quickly to that. Our ongoing research project here has been uh, going since 1995, started by Professor Paul Rulaney, has been running with SX Tenetius variable stars. So I myself was actually a big uh, Subwork B fan. <laughs> so variable stars have been uh, a high priority for me for forever. And uh, it's wonderful to have them started up here again. Variable stars are wonderful, wonderful targets for astronomers of all kinds. And um, we can follow them very easily with the 60, the one meter, or even the 40 centimeter telescopes. So the original telescopes at the uh, Allen I. Carswell Observatory, and that when I say original, I mean pre-2019, so not that long ago, we had the 40 centimeter telescope and the 60 centimeter telescope. These were the two main observatory telescopes for outreach and for research uh, until quite recently. So this is the this is how it used to be. And then, and then one day in uh, 2017, um, Alan I. Carswell donated uh, from his Carswell Foundation $500,000 to help uh, us, i.e. the observatory, buy a new one meter telescope. The donation was matched by the, uh, by the university and the observatory was renamed. And so if you ever wonder why we're called the Alan I. Carswell Observatory, it's because this was what led to the one meter telescope that you just saw existing. So this is the uh, the official dedication uh, plaque, uh, which is still up on the wall. So you, if you come by, you can always see it. Um, searching for the one meter was a little bit of a, a you know a task, and a lot of uh, a lot of telescopes are out there, but not many groups are in the position to buy and build a one meter class telescope. So if you want a ten meter class telescope, well, there's large observatory consortiums and places that do that, but um, you know, basically, with price and capabilities, we went with plane wave. So we have a plane wave 1000. And of all the plane wave instruments, they have uh, a lot of different CDK 700 telescopes. Um, and there, there, uh, some other places in Canada, you can find plane wave uh, CDK 700s or um, the Simon Fraser's Charger Observatory, the Science Courtyard, and St. Mary. Burke Gaffney Observatory. Those are uh, CDK 700, so a bit smaller. So in 2019, to make a long story short, the telescope finally arrived. Um, it was craned in through the original domes and the plane wave 1000, fully automated, one meter class telescope came in. Um, it really has been a game changer for the observatory and I think for astronomy in Toronto because it has a direct drive mount technology. Now I mentioned that we would not touch it while it, its drive was engaged because that direct drive system is so beautifully accurate. It would be just a shame for it to risk any kind of friction to it. So the alt as direct drive technology requires a large amount of computing power. This is not a telescope that you could easily calculate and align yourself. Altitude and azimuth is a, a challenging calculation to make. Um, but with its computer system and its, um, its existing drive, it absolutely sets a standard for one meter observatory telescopes. I think we'll be seeing a lot more of these around as, as more people learn about them. So this uh, telescope is worth noting. It's not just an altitude azimuth telescope. It's actually a corrected Dahl-Kirkham CDK telescope. 
The CDK has three main components, a, a ellipsoidal primary, um, which you may have seen in the video, a spherical secondary, and a lens group. So this means that our telescope is basically coma-free, aberration, coma aberration free. It has no off-axis astigmatism and has a very, very flat field. Uh, this makes it very, very easy to calibrate, which is just lovely. So I don't think I have to sell a bunch of astronomers on uh, how, how it is, of course, um, very, very nice to be able to show off a little bit some of the capacity that we have in this, this new model. So uh, the corrected Dell Perkham CDK telescope uh, does have a tertiary mirror, which of course allows light to be sent to either one of the two dual NASMIC ports. And that means we can have two main mounting positions. So we have a series of instruments that are mounted on the uh, uh, one Nasmith port with a Perseus uh, four junction connector. And the other port we use for either guest instruments or an eyepiece. Uh, there was actually a guest instrument on tonight uh, from Killarney, Park's, uh, uh, Killarney Park Observatory organizer, uh, Bruce Waters. Otherwise, I could have shown you an eyepiece, too, I suppose. So here is our lovely uh, plane wave 1000 schematic. It is an F6 for those of you who are interested. And of course, um, you know, this is what it looks like out of the box. It has got a little bit more dust on it in person now. So the dimensions of the plane wave 1000 are substantially more compact than things like the older model uh, 60 centimeter telescope, which as you saw was uh, Send it off into uh, into the dome. So a few fun highlights of the newer telescope, uh, you know, new as in 2019. This telescope um, has a one degree uh, circle image circle, and of course, dual NASA ports, as I mentioned before. The direct drive motors are extremely smooth, and virtually silent is both a blessing and a curse. Because it is so quiet, you will never hear it coming. So in order to operate this telescope, you do have to make sure that there's no chance that any students have wandered onto the platform um, because they, it, it, it moves very quickly and very, very quietly. Um, so far, so good. So there is zero backlash, zero periodic error. It's got a, a point modeling software and every once in a while, about once a year, we redo the pointing model. Um, other than that, it's extremely stable. It also has a derotator. So you can derotate your fields as you're observing them, and it makes image stacking much, much easier. And of course, the primary mirror shutter is very, very nice because it means I don't have to put on an extra cover on top of the primary mirror. You just have to cover the back hole and the secondary mirror. So a few fun features of the dual Nasimuth ports is that they are um, along the altitude axis, which makes them uh, extremely easy to balance. So as the telescope rotates, the along axis dual Nasimuth ports, the instruments do not change their position in altitude, and uh, they do not need to be rebalanced at all. And the balancing of the telescope is perfect. Um, this is also a contrast to the 60 centimeter telescope, which has a counterweight it has to be rebalanced every time the instruments change on the back end. Um, all right, so the direct drive motors, this one I put in just for the enthusiasts. If you really want to know what kind of direct drive motors live inside a telescope like this, it is 24 coils and 32 neodymium magnets. So it is actually, in a very real sense, magnetically levitating, and it's got a three phase axial flux torque motor. So there's no actual gears at all. It's all running off of these coiled uh, magnets. And this is again, totally different from the 60 centimeter, which is running on a gear system. And I don't know uh, what will happen to this system in uh, 50 years, <laughs> uh, but right now it's amazing. So, and again, with a system like this in a very, very different design from the, the older model telescopes, um, we do have to have advanced software control. The plane wave interface is what we use for this telescope. Um, you know, the interface literally developed by the same company that made the telescope. Uh, so it basically allows to control things like the focuser, the rotator, uh, um, 
fans for uh, uh, cooling the telescope or just uh, helping to remove moisture from the telescope. Um, it actually has an automatic focus routine, which is pretty darn good as well. And it interfaces with the new dome rotation system via ASPOM, which I'll talk about in a second. So, um, since we've talked about so many technical de details, I thought it would be fun uh, for anybody in the chat who is watching live on YouTube. Uh, I always like to throw in a little bit of fun things. So I thought, why not put a riddle, an astronomy riddle, in the talk? Uh, so can you can you guess the answer uh, to this riddle? And this is the, this is how it goes. But uh, what am I? When looking at the night sky, you're able to see the moon. But you might need to use this if you want to see Neptune. So that's how the riddle goes. Um, so we'll just ask uh, anybody who wants to take a guess in chat. We'll do a, uh, a three, two, one. Final guesses now. And let's see if anybody got it. You guys can tell me during the question section. Obviously, I think obviously the answer is a telescope. So um, I hope I hope a lot of people guessed it. Uh, but this is, of course, our telescope. And it has viewed both Neptune, Uranus, Pluto, uh, Saturn, um, Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, and am I forgetting any? Uh, the moon, our moon. So um, it has been around for, for quite a while. So this is uh, one of the reasons why we, we are extremely happy to have the, the telescope here and how I can offer it as a, a potential tool for astronomers. Of course, uh, imaging and live imaging is great. Uh, if you do collect scientific images, i.e. Uh, from our, our, uh, our regular SFIG CCD camera, we can compile those images with IRAF or FixInsight or various other software to produce color images that are incredibly detailed. Um, here are some images that have come through uh, from, from our time with the one meter so far. Obviously, it's very, very good at messy objects, globular clusters, galaxies, and even uh, nebulae. So the astrophotography uh, for the one meter uh, telescope uh, is one of the biggest benefits. Um, we do have a, a spectrometer as well, which is something that's still undergoing commissioning, uh, but we're really excited to, uh, to bring that in. So there's a huge amount of benefits to having the telescope here and being able to share it with all of you tonight. Stefan's Quintet, uh, this was captured by the one meter. And this is a great one if you're ever trying to test your galaxy imaging capability, because of course you get to do several galaxies all in one. So you get NGC 7317, 7318A, 7318B, 7319B, and 7320B. So this is the little dumbbell nebula, uh, one of our one of the more difficult nebula to capture. And this was done again with a red, green, and blue filters, which were then compiled and put together um, after imaging. So this is not a mail and cam image, I suppose I should say. And I'll just script through a couple uh, to get to the moon. We do actually have a compilation image, which was stitched together by one of our students uh, of the moon using the one meter telescope with a neutral density filter. Um, if you have a telescope that is larger, uh, things like the moon, uh, Jupiter, and, and, and of course, Venus and other very bright objects can overexpose your CCDs. So neutral density filters can be a great way to get around that. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and share uh, two of our students, uh, Senna and Gagan, who were undergraduate students, decided to do a Messier marathon. Um, and this is, these are a few of the images that they produced from that Messier marathon. Uh, some, some they managed to get all three colors and some just one color image. Um, and one color images, if you don't know, they turn out as black and white. All right, so very fun stuff. Um, but what happened to the 40? So this is a question I, I get asked a lot. Uh, we got this one meter telescope and I did say the original telescopes were the 40 centimeter and the 60 centimeter. I showed you the 60 centimeter, um, but what happened to the 40 centimeter telescope? Well, the 40 centimeter telescope, it was here and it was actually where the one meter is now. 
to move the one meter onto that spot, we had to remove the 40 and expand the pier. The 40 was actually migrated across the street, uh, across the walkway, I should say, on top of the Arboretum parking garage. So we have moved it out of the domes in, on top of the parking garage, and it gets a special park uh, where it is protected. It is relatively safe and sound, um, and it is used for mostly star parties and summer viewing, but it is actually still usable uh, for CCD astronomy and Malin chem imaging, uh, which is great fun during the summertime. Uh, not so much fun right now. So the 40 centimeter astrophotography and uh, star parties, if you're interested, uh, this is the same telescope that took a lot of the older astrophotography at uh, York University. It's a Mead LX200 EMC Schmidt cast grain telescope. Um, it's a nice 40 centimeter telescope, which has a uh, uh, good, good capacity with light gathering power. And it does have a computerized alt azimuth mount, um, so it can actually track objects across the sky. It has become, in recent times, our main telescope for public viewing and for us um, in the summer, I should say. Uh, astrophotography after 2019 shifted to the one meter telescope for probably obvious reasons. Um, so, all of that aside, uh, I have just begun to tell you about the changes that we have done to the observatory recently. So I do have a couple more fun updates. Uh, I should say, I hope you all find them as fun as I do. <laughs> From the Allen I Carswell Observatory, uh, after 2019, we did have a one meter telescope in the domes um, and the domes were original to the building of the uh, science and I suppose science and engineering department, the Petrie building, which meant they came from the 1960s. They were over 50 years old, and these domes had a number of issues. Um, only one of them had any ability to follow a telescope, and they uh, they leaked. Um, I won't show you any pictures of the flooding or the snow because they're too sad. Uh, but they were a serious hazard to the new one meter telescope as well as just uh, telescopes in general. So in 2022, we finally got approved for new domes. Um, and this is the second major part of the renovations at the Allen I. Carswell Observatory that has happened. So this came in um, uh, in 2022, which I want to say was last year, but now it's 2024 again. So <laughs> the years just ticked over. Uh, the new domes were installed uh, by a company called Sea West, and they literally brought us uh, ash domes, which were the exact same dome model as uh, our original domes. So the uh, dome company that had made the originals was still around. Now we have an updated version with a new shutter that doesn't leak. It's got lovely gavlum uh, coating, and it, here's a couple of fun pictures in progress. They constructed these new 22-foot domes on the ground uh, just to the side of the observatory. This is a picture of the new domes opening and testing their, mo their motors. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, this has a hydraulic lifted down shutter, which is fundamentally different than the old domes, which had a pull-up shutter, uh, which apparently at one time had dropped and fell through the roof. But it also involved a very long uh, dangly string you had to pull on to clap or unclap the lock or the shutter. So this design is uh, much, much stronger in terms of uh, um, uh, sort of dome shutter robustness. So we have here some lovely pictures of under construction, as well as, of course, the obligatory dome flying through the air. Uh, you know, you blur this out a little bit, you have a great UFO picture. Um, but this is June 2022. The roofs came off, uh, we pulled off the old domes, off with the old, on with the new. And this is our new ash domes uh, flying through the air via a very, very large crane. And I have to give special thanks to our facilities team here at York who uh, who helped us with this, and especially Jonathan Savalos. Uh, do not try to do this project without an engineering team leader. <laughs>
Okay, sorry, I hope I'm back. I just got a, a short, um, short message. So hopefully this is, <laughs> so hopefully we're back now. Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, I think we're back. Um, and I was just on the new domes. So new, new dome fun facts uh, for the LNA Carswell Observatory, lower hydraulic doors means that we can aim to lower objects on the sky. We're no longer limited by the bottom shutter. And in putting in the domes, we also put in several new safety systems, including a weather system that detects clouds, which is pretty fun. It's uh, multiple targets can be imaged in one night because the dome program controls can be linked to the telescope controls. Of course, uh, one fun thing I also have to mention, and this is me, on the left, uh, we got to take apart the old domes. So the old domes that uh, had served us so well for so long um, and then started leaking, <laughs> did get to be dismantled. And we do have a few pieces from that old dome, one of which I mentioned to you is, is now mounted on the wall. So this is the deconstruction phase, which is also quite fun. Uh, so as part of this project, we didn't just replace the domes, we needed the 60 centimeter to be able to interact with the new domes and have as accurate a pointing as perhaps the one meter, if possible. And to do that, we had to replace the encoders. So it's sort of like the story, if you give a mouse a cookie, but uh, if you give an astronomer a big telescope, <laughs> the big telescope needed new domes, the new domes demanded the second telescope get an encoder upgrade, and so we did. Um, these encoders have since been entirely replaced with a whole new control system for RA and DEC on the 60 centimeter telescope. In addition, we have uh, replaced the electronics system of the observatory. That power control system, the emergency backup, uh, the uninterruptible power sources for both the domes and the computers. We now have a network rack. We have dome control, control boxes. We have a weather system. And we have the Perseus port, which hosts multiple instruments. All of these were all part of upgrades done in, I can't believe it, the last year and a half. So a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have come off. But the, uh, the gears of the 60 are one of the ones that have remained the same. So finally, I'd like to round off with a, a little bit of a, a victory tour. As part of this renovation for the Allen A. Kurzweil Observatory, uh, we were actually able to get approved to replace uh, the flooring while we were working on the encoders for the 60 centimeter telescope we noticed that the original floors to the uh, 60 were causing a lot of problems uh, they were cracked tiling uh, they were extremely slippery uh, extremely uh, extremely low friction surfaces um, they provided quite a bit of a hazard and uh, originally, they were likely at some point polished cement, but a long, long time ago, asbestos tiling was actually installed. And cracking uh, asbestos tiling does not sound so great. So while we were doing the encoders, we were able to untangle the, uh, the flooring issue and actually get the floors done as well. Um, so they let us pick a new kind of flooring. So of course we went with the Starry Night one. I, that's why I tried to show you the floors in there. I don't know if it came through, but uh, taking apart the floors, uh, we also put in a an actual door to the warm room, and uh, we had to cover everything. So this is the uh, the telescope um, progress. We after the flood, the tiles had been removed. We could see the cement underneath. And we discovered that the original tiles had been glued on with a kind of paste. So again, you give a mouse a cookie and underneath the tiles of paste, we actually had to polish the floors before we could re re um, reset them. So this is my favorite uh, telescope picture from the flooring time when we had covered the 60 centimeter and the light was coming in just right from the, uh, from the dome cameras, which is another system that we've installed, uh, cameras on each telescope to watch them as they go across the sky. Um, so finally, we painted the 60 centimeter telescope, which is probably the first time it's seen paint in uh, a long, long time. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, just got a uh, just checking that we're still connected. <laughs> um, so we did get to paint the 60 centimeter telescope and redo the floors. So finally, we put in uh, as our, our part of our grand renovation opening, we actually put in a lounge. And this will, I'll say that we have to give special, uh, special thanks and acknowledgement to the York facilities uh, because they brought us um, sort of upcycled materials. And it's a great reason not to throw away any, uh, any couches or cabinets you might be thinking about because maybe an observatory somewhere wants to use them for a, a lounge. Um, so this is our new observatory lounge area, which we've hooked up with the telescope. And of course, um, of course we have a, uh, a new, what's called carnival cutout as well. So we put this in um, just last year with our working video screen, I should say. And finally, this is the new set, <laughs> the new setup. So the telescopes now, we have the one meter, the 60 centimeter, and the 40 centimeter with, of course, the new domes um, under a, uh, a working floor. And we have been running both telescopes simultaneously on several different nights. Uh, not all three so far. <laughs> so the official grand reopening for the telescopes was September of last year. Um, we did a we did a bit of a, a astronomy fest with lots of extra swag and uh, uh, fun stuff. Um, and if you missed it, we're now doing open tours every Wednesday, just in case any RAS members feel like they might want to come along. So here are some pictures of our our renovated telescope, I should say, um, and of course what you saw in the video, just in case anything was too dark, the warm room the one meter and the, uh, the control box with the mandatory danger signs. Uh, we do have some fun photo walls and, and things like that for people to take space pictures with. Um, and we also have a lot of public observing, much like RASC does uh, every Wednesday night and also for, for special tours. So we're looking forward to doing lots and lots of solar events in the lead up to the solar eclipse this year, of course. So finally, um, I'm just going to round off, I think, the uh, the grand tour here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much time I have left, but I think I think we're doing all right. Um, if any RASC members are interested in observing with the telescopes on campus at uh, the Ellen I. Kurzweil Observatory, um, they should consider applying for time. Um, this is one that we were able to launch just last year. Uh, it's an official time application um, form. Sorry, I'm just getting a little bit of a second there. Okay, so this is our official time application form. Um, it, and I will just note that there is a special uh, RASP dedicated night. Um, you do not have to, if you are going to apply for time, you do not have to apply on the RASP dedicated night. But the RASP dedicated night is specifically for um, variable star RASP observers in honor of, uh, of Blank, Blank Dan Carroll, who unfortunately did pass away in 2023. Um, so you're guaranteed time for variable star observing on the last Friday. Uh, now, as a final round off, uh, the observatory, the Allen I. Carswell Observatory, will be coordinating with Killarney Provincial Park again this year in 2024. I've just confirmed with the park um, that we will be coming back for the same summer period uh, where we send an astronomer uh, to Killarney Provincial Park Observatory for a week or two weeks, or in some cases, even three weeks. Um, it does come with free parking and lodging. And it's for people who are fluent in general astronomy knowledge, stargazing, and telescope operation. So of course, I thought of RASC members right away for this one. Um, this is a little note. I will put the QR code up here uh, for the Astronomer in Residence program. Uh, if anyone's interested, it is running again this year. And of course, um, it should uh, hopefully run for many years to come. It's a lovely, lovely clear sky, and it is actually a dark sky certified site up there. Unlike York University, um, they do actually have proper dark skies. You can see the Andromeda Galaxy make, as a naked eye object, uh, just barely. So this is around the end of our presentation here. I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, be around for questions. 
So I hope that everybody has enjoyed this tour of the Allen A. Carswell Observatory, our, all of our telescopes, all of our upgrades, and all of this wonderful news. Um, thanks for having me on tonight. I suppose it's a bit to be. And let's pass over to Emma for questions. Great presentation. Um, you did get some questions. So the first one is, regarding variable star photometry, which photometric filters are available? So we have what are called the Johnson Cousins filters, and it's R uh, R G B V R I. Uh, we also have three neutral density filters, ND two, four, and five. Uh, but that's not so much for uh, um, astrophotography as just very bright objects. Great, that actually answers um, the next question as well. Um, <laughs> that's. Actually, I think that's all the questions we have for the time being, but um, given the delay, something might pop up in a second. But um, yeah, it was really cool to see all those, uh, to see the observatory. Yeah, I hope everyone was able to see along. This is the first time we've tried to do a, a live in-person tour during a talk. So I don't know how much of it came through, but um, it does. It uh, it is always very fun to to share some of the updates. And since we've had so many things change here, I thought, hey, this will be a great topic for a talk. <laughs> um, all right. So if there's no other uh, no other questions that have arise, let me go ahead and just take this uh, take this time to put on my uh, rash cat. And um, say it's been a wonderful time to come and present. I hope that you all have uh, have enjoyed the observatory uh, at least a tenth as much as I have, because it's been really, really fun. We have, um, as I say, nearly infinite different projects that are running at the moment, and it's always great to be able to show live images, um, you know, for whatever clear sky tiny breaks that we that we have. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and wrap up uh, wrap up tonight if there's no other questions. And I will say, um, you know, uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, let's go ahead um, and, oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, hold on, there is another question. Uh, for, variable is another question. Star okay. observations, uh, for variable star observations, what is the faintest star observable? That is an excellent question. So the faintest, star observable will depend on the night. And we are on York University campus. So although we have imaged objects of 20th magnitude, um, depending on whether or not they have turned off the football stadium lights, <laughs> um, we would have a slightly, uh, slightly higher or lower uh, magnitude recommended. Um, that said, I, I would hesitate be going fainter than, say, 22nd magnitude would not be a great idea. Your exposure times would start to get extremely long. Great. Um, I do think that, uh, by, oh, I might be wrong about this, but I think the bylaws are that the football stadium lights have to be off after 11. So <laughs> I, think, I guess they're uh, too <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, um, that is actually not the case. Uh, they're allowed to practice uh, past uh, past the midnight if they've got uh, things happening. So, um, but at, wow. during the winter time, we now have a dome that goes over the football stadium, and so this is actually one of the best times to view faint objects. In Toronto, because uh, you can use a one meter class telescope and there's no football stadium lights on. So all we need is a really, really clear night and you're good to go. And a warm jacket. <laughs> a warm, yes, and a scarf and gloves. All right. Um, I do believe that's all the questions now. Thanks. All right. I have no idea what the timing is because I've completely lost track of time and space. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up tonight. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming along with me on this little adventure. And let's go ahead and hand over to the president of Toronto Centre RASC, Tom Luton, to finish off the evening. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, and uh, thank you for giving us this tour on, unfortunately, what has turned out to be the coldest night of the winter so far. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, thank you very much to everyone joining us uh, online. If you're in the Toronto area, you know that this is a fairly chilly night. So we're glad to be uh, part of the evening's entertainment. So let's get on to the announcements. We have two types of meetings here on uh, YouTube. Uh, our recreational astronomy nights are uh, going to be up in two weeks. And then our speakers nights are going to be two weeks after that. Uh, generally, uh, the first of the month uh, for the recreational astronomy nights and speaker nights being the third Wednesday of the month. Uh, if you're joining us live uh, on YouTube, please uh, say hello in the chat, uh, enter some questions for the presenters. If you are a new member, please introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far outside the Toronto area, please let us know where you're coming from. So our next Recreational Astronomy Night, uh, 7.30 p.m., Wednesday, the 7th of February, um, both uh, here on YouTube and live in person at the Ontario Science Centre. Uh, the sky this month, um, uh, the presenter is still to be announced. Uh, Ron McNaughton will be discussing how ancient uh, peoples uh, predicted solar and lunar eclipses. And also, we have one more presentation slot available. Um, if you'd like to present something, please uh, drop Paul Markov a line. And we'd love to uh, see you in person. Um, we're still waiting to finalize some details for our next speaker's night, which is going to be on Wednesday, the 21st of February. This is an online event only, live here on YouTube. Uh, coming up on the 3rd of fe February is solar observing in front of the Ontario Science Centre from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. RASC volunteers will be setting up uh, filtered telescopes in the plaza in front of the Science Centre and will be giving folks uh, a view of whatever the sun is doing that day. Uh, as always, this is a weather-dependent event, so please check our website for a go or no-go call before heading out. Uh, our star parties, our city star parties for the winter months are uh, slight changes to uh, plan schedule. Um, the regular star party at Bayview Village Park is on hiatus until April uh, because they don't uh, clear the walkways uh, in the park. So it's a bit snowed over. Uh, the Long Branch Park will be going ahead. However, it's not going to be uh, scheduled. It's more going to be a case of if the if a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or holiday night uh, is really clear, and if the park is uh, uh, safe and fit for a star party, um, we'll make a call. Uh, check our website for a go, no-go decision uh, before heading out. Coming up at David Dunlop Observatory in Richmond Hill, uh, we've got uh, Astronomy Family Night on Saturday, the 19th of January, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. EST. Registration uh, links uh, can be found at uh, rasktio.ca. And then coming up on Sunday, the 21st of January, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. is virtual Sunday sun gazing. Again, registration uh, links can be found at rasktio.ca. So uh, the CAO is now open for the winter. If you hadn't heard, we've got an arrangement set up, uh, and we are now uh, getting the road plowed and the driveway, which means that um, it's no longer uh closed during the winter to the exception of those hardy folks with snowshoes and cross-country skis. Um, so operations of the CAO are largely back to pre-pandemic conditions, but there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, the biggest one being that we are still running with a maximum of two unrelated persons per bedroom who mutually agree to share said room, and masking the common, common areas is encouraged, but we are running with the preference of the people who are actually in attendance. Uh, please take a look at the CAO bookings page for all of the details uh, uh, to make your bookings. Just a brief shout out. We are still looking to fill some spots. We're still looking for a volunteer committee chair, a marketing committee chair, and some new committee members. Uh, 
And the Education and Public Outreach Committee is always looking for additional help, uh, especially telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. And a reminder that in order to be a volunteer, you must be a member of the Toronto Centre. Uh, thank you very much for everyone, though, who keeps uh, emailing me in and asking if they can lend a hand. Um, drop me a line at president at rasco.ca if you'd like to help out. Brief plug for RASC membership. If you like what you've seen here and if you'd like to become a full-fledged member, uh, you can renew or you can sign up or sorry, you can sign up or you can renew your existing membership at secure.rask.ca. Gift memberships are also available. Contact the national office at mempub at rask.ca. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much for joining us here online. Please follow us on all the forms of social media that we've got listed here. And if you liked what you saw here on YouTube, please like and subscribe, hit the notification bell. Be safe and keep looking up. Good night, everyone.